Time to say a very good morning to Helen Dale. Helen, hello, how are you? Good morning, Mike. How are you? Very well indeed. So much to talk about today, really. But uh, I guess we should begin with the conversation. I don't know if you heard it. I had with Christine Jardine. This idea of misogyny as a hate crime. I'm troubled by how they're going to define it. I'm troubled by how it's going to be sort of endorsed, uh, where the police are going to draw the lines, because it's always very difficult, I think, to to give the sort of uh, the, the I suppose the, the, the proof element to the person who's the victim. So if the victim perceives themselves to have been racially abused, you've committed a racist crime. If the person perceives themselves to have been the victim of misogyny, you're a misogynist. Well, this is the basis of the uh, hate crime operational guidance and the problem of uh, perception-based policing, yeah. which a number of police officers have difficulties with because it places the police in a very difficult position. Mm. But there's actually a more serious and simpler problem with enacting more laws of whatever sort uh, to deal with the fallout from the Sarah Everard case. And I don't wish to discuss the case, obviously, because mm. it's sub judice, yeah. apart from the most casual references. But the fallout from that um, has revealed a large number of women in London have experienced regularly constant low level um, harassment and bad behaviour that typically doesn't reach the threshold of, of criminality, but it's still really irritating. Yeah. You know, constant um, comments on the tube and, you know, backside pinching. And the thing is, if it's only done once, you know, sexual harassment requires a course of conduct. So what this is what we're starting to hear as a result of the fallout from the, the Sarah Everard case without denying for a moment that the Sarah Everard case is obviously much more serious mm. and there are problems in our legal system and some of the commentators on it who struggle to draw a distinction between minor low-grade behaviour like bottom pinching and wolf whistling mm. and yahooing out of car windows and that kind of thing and something like the Sarah Everard case um, and introducing new hate crime statutes is an example of that because the really simple basic problem with all these laws is they must be enforced yeah you know you they and they and if you're going to have them enforced they must also be capable of enforcement and there is a serious case to be made that pretty much all of the hate crime legislation and the analogous legislation where hate crime isn't explicitly used but things like uh, section 127 subsection one of the Communications Act 2003, which was, for example, used against the comedian, Marcus Meekin, Count Dankula, mm. the chap who trained his pug dog to do a Nazi salute. Yeah. They didn't use hate crime legislation there because it would have been ridiculous, but they used legislation that's actually existed in that form since the 1930s mm. and was originally drafted and you'll laugh at this because it, it really does show a generational divide to deal with people when telephone books first became available who would ring random people up in the phone book and abuse them right. and the classic form of abuse was the heavy breathing down the phone line done to a woman who lived alone yes. So that original legislation... I, you know, I've completely to... forgotten about that. You've just reminded yes, me exactly. that, that used to be a thing. It used to be a thing. Yeah. You know, or prank calls. Yeah. I mean, the, the American horror film, you know, the calls are coming from inside the house. Yes. If you show that to modern young people now, they don't understand it because they don't get the distinction mm. between a mobile phone and a landline yeah. and how landlines actually work. Yeah. <laughs> So, um, so all of this has to be enforceable. Mm. We already know that we have serious enforcement issues with the um, le legislation that e already exists. Mm. And then there are other criminological issues uh, to do with the perpetration of sex offences that people are not taking into account. And no. if you don't mind, I mean, I tweeted about it last night and you know the story because I told you privately. Um, that I had BBC big questions in contact 
with me yesterday, yeah. obviously because they wanted a lawyer to talk about changes to the law, not just misogyny as a hate crime, but mm. the uh, police and policing and crime bill that's that's just gone through, and uh, how do you improve conviction rates for rape? And these were the questions they were asking me, which were perfectly good questions. And the thing is, I basically sat there and did a combination of what we discussed last week on the Independent Republic about recidivism and yes. rape and the characteristics of sex offenders. And now basically what I'm doing now, issues with enforcement, issues with victimisation, you know, who is victimised and why, and the very large difference between low-grade bad behaviour that falls short of a criminal threshold, yahooing out car windows, that kind of thing, wolf whistles, catcalling, and very serious sex offences. Because one of the things that criminologists know is that the two the perpetrators of those two sets of behaviours are different people. There's no overlap, basically. Right. But by the same token, there are certain kinds of minor sex offences that are indicative of a pattern of crim criminal behaviour, although criminologists are still arguing very intensely. And there was a very good piece in a little magazine called The Article. It's just called The Article. I don't know why they call themselves that. But she's a, she was a criminologist. And she talked about how it used to be in criminal profiling. If you encountered someone who engaged in animal abuse or who was a flasher, who exposed yeah. themselves or so on and so forth, um, you would have to pay attention to their subsequent patterns of offending because it tended to, to ramp up. Mm. You know, yes. and then you can the get problem, quite serious. I mean, the problem with all of this, Helen, is it, is it, is it not, as you say, it's, it's about enforcement, but it's also about conviction as well. And in any um, sexual yes. offence, a lot of the time, you're going to have two versions of an event, aren't you? And so that's why an awful lot of rape cases, for example, don't successfully get prosecuted because there simply isn't enough evidence to prosecute them. And that's never going to change. But the worry well, for me... Well, you can make is... it a little bit better. And one of the things I suggested very provisionally, because you don't necessarily know how these things work, is that we could bring some ideas across from Roman law, particularly as the way they're used in France. Now, basically, there's this uh, one of the tests in to secure a rape conviction that the, one of the hoops that people go through is that if the perpetrator, the accused, uh, believed that the woman was consenting, the belief has to be reasonable. It can't be unreasonable mm. or he'll be convicted. Yeah. But the problem is you then finish up circling the drain and working out what's reasonable. So everybody just, it just, just descends into a passion dale of evidentiary, he said, she mm. said fighting. And this is a notorious experience and people who've worked in the criminal law will tell yeah. you this until the cows come home. Now, the way the French deal with it is to do an objective test of the behavior. What does this look like? to a reasonable third person. Not a reasonable woman in the position of the victim, not a reasonable man in the position of the, of the perpetrator, um, but a reasonable person looking at it externally. So they apply the same sort of reasonable person test that we're quite familiar with from the law of contract, the law of delict and mm. tort, you know, so negligence, uh, rather than the sort of subjective he said, she said test. And France does have higher conviction rates. And is, is that as a direct well, result of that, do you think? Because I wonder often it, whether whether you would get a different result just because you look at it differently. Some criminologists argue that it is as a result of that. Others argue that it isn't, that it's a characteristic of the way Roman law works mm. and the way its laws of evidence work. This is why you have to be very careful when you make suggestions like this, because... The two great legal families, and there are only two, are the common law system that was developed here in England, literally in England, and then the Roman law system that was developed by the ancient mm. Romans, you know, the dudes with the, the fancy crests on their hats. You know, apart from engineering and conquering people, you know, all those fancy bridges and aqueducts, they were also very good lawyers. Yeah. And no, I so get all the that. Europe... But here's the, yeah, here's, so the, the... here's the question, though, I've got for you, because when I was talking to Christine Jardin, she says we must do something, right, which is often the clarion call that comes from politicians. But doing something uh, is sometimes worse than doing nothing if the something that you do makes everything more complicated. And I just think that, you know, by adding another layer of, of something like calling something a hate crime as a misogynistic thing, that's not going to alter the number of uh, offences that get committed in a serious uh, sexual assault or uh, no, in a rape No, it's an case. example. It's you know, an example but, but, of the politic. But what's the point of it? It's an example of, of the politician syllogism. Yeah, we must do something. Here is something. Let's do that thing. Yes, and there's a lot of that flying around. And so here was me to 
talking to the BBC big questions people, going through all of this very nuanced stuff, research done by criminologists, research done by specialists in Roman law, including some really distinguished scholars up at the University of Edinburgh, you know, people like Professor Paul de Plessy, you know, that kind of thing, you know, where you where they, these people really try to think carefully about the consequences of dragging things across from the other great legal family, which is very different. You know, Absol one of the absolutely. reasons why the European Union's had so many difficulties with the vaccine rollout, for example, is partly because of the, the two, these two great legal families. They don't mesh well. And I mean, that's why Guy Verhofstadt was, wrote his piece and tweeted about how our lawyers just have gone in basically naked and have been incompetent draftsmen mm. and have not known what they're doing. But a significant part of that is because the two legal families don't mesh. Right. So, and so, so he's so, been so, explaining so point... all this nuanced stuff and mm. the man from BBC Big Questions is going, this is really hard, isn't it? And I'm going, yes, it is. Yeah. It's really hard. Well, of course it's hard. I mean, that's the point. And therefore, uh, it is not soluble or solvable by one simple word, uh, which apparently is going to record all of these uh, instruments of, of, of law and prosecution in a different way. Because as I said to her, I mean, if you're going to be sexually assaulting a woman, there's a pretty good chance that you are a misogynist. If you're going to be raping a woman, there's a pretty good chance that you are a misogynist. It doesn't have to be written down that you are one. And I just worry as well, with all of the, the way that the data is now used for everything, that it will be used as some kind of, um, you know, excuse for doing something else. Well, what you get is what you will inevitably get is prosecutions like the Count Dankula case with the, the Nazi saluting pug dog or like the Harry Miller case, the man who the, the former police officer who became a stevedore, who 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 tweeted an amusing but you could argue anti trans tweet. He was he was taking the wee, basically mm. extracting the urine, and yeah, he finished. And he finished up with one of these non-crime hate incidents on his record. Right. And the, pro the the problem, I mean, with Marcus Meekin, the Scottish comedian, he was actually convicted, but it, at but at least you there was an, a public process and it wasn't sinister. Right. Whereas what has happened with these non-crime hate incidences of incidents of which there are thousands every year is they're really quite sinister because you don't actually know whether there's one recorded against you mm. until you do what uh, ba the barrister Sarah Fillimore did and she she knew to look for this but then she's a barrister you would expect this is she actually went and got an enhanced DBS check and found them on her record yeah. now this isn't a crime this is a woman who's a barrister in good standing and, who and else, a member and who, of the bar. But who else, Helen, would find that? Who else would know about that? Um, how would you discover it about someone? Well, this well, often what has happened, and this is Harry Miller's argument, what has happened is people find out that there's one of these on these rec on their records when they try to apply for a job mm. where an enhanced DBS check is necessary, and suddenly this comes up and they haven't got the job anymore. Mm. Yeah. So which, that's where which, it turns up. Which is very sinister because, as you say, it's not actually a crime, is it? No. But the thing is, it, because it appears on a document that has your priors on it. I mean, this is what prosecuting counsel get. I mean, you have a trial, OK, and obviously this in, prosecuting counsel know this kind of thing, but the, it's not shared with the jury because it's prejudicial to the... It, it, it might be probative, but it's highly prejudicial, so it's not introduced as evidence except in very limited circumstances, and that's the laws of evidence um, and procedure. But the uh, But the point is... We all have a record and the prosecuting counsel will get those records, but it's only revealed at sentence yes. if someone is convicted, the substantive content of those records. So what is effectively being done? Yes, it's at a lower level. No one's going to jail over this, but people uh, don't know that they exist. They're in, in te, it's perception-based policing, so it's intensely subjective. It's based on the alleged victim, and I have to say alleged because it's just a claim. It, there's, in well, the that's the trouble, isn't it? Because, of course, uh, uh, you know, people will want to see more convictions in rape cases, but they will also see that there can be, and have been quite often, um, allegations made which were untrue. And therefore, you know, if the assumption is that the victim perceives it to be a misogynistic crime, 
that that will then be prosecuted as a misogynistic crime, and that will or somehow, recorded as a yeah, non or and, recorded and, as a non crime yeah, hate incident, yes. which is which is very disabling if you well, want to is. be a teacher or a well, carer exactly, well, or a police exactly. officer. But but what I'm saying yeah. is it becomes a whole different ball game. It becomes a much more subjective conversation rather than a judicial one, and I think that's where it's going wrong. Uh, well. <laughs> What it is, it is the classic politician syllogism. We've mm. got this problem, and we, and if nothing else, the Sarah Everard case has exposed it, and that's probably a good thing, so people are aware that this is happening. Um, and then you've got all of these people trying to come up with a simple solution. And there's that very famous quotation from the American journalist H.L. Mencken, who used to say, you know, to every complex problem, there's always a simple solution, and it's always wrong. And I mean, uh, this requires a lot more thought, a mm. lot more care, enacting more legislation, over criminalizing, which was very much how we responded to the war on terror. And it's how the Americans uh, banned the war on drugs. We've seen how these things go wrong. You know, you'd think we'd have learned something now. You know, people have to step back allow the judicial process in the case of both the trial and the inquest mm. in the Sarah Everard matter yeah. to, to, to proceed, you know, let the legal system do its work, but also have a serious and adult conversation about things that are very, very discomforting. Mm. Like, I, and, I very, and also cont- very different. I mean, Sarah Everard um, has been uh, killed by somebody, right? We aren't going to say she's been murdered by somebody yet because we don't know the, the full details if of the don't case. Know. Yes. However, uh, you know, things like that happen uh, on a relatively rare basis, thankfully. Cressida but Dick it does is not, enti- but entirely it, right to say this, yes. Yeah, but it, what it doesn't do is reveal that we live in some kind of incredibly misogynistic society because a woman has been possibly killed by a man. That doesn't mean the same thing. No, it doesn't. And I mean, and there are very uncomfortable conversations to be had in this area. I mean, as part of the sort of fallout from <laughs> I nuanced myself off of the BBC yesterday. I put it up on Facebook and yeah. on mine. Well, you saved yourself um, by bothering on a Sunday morning. I suspect you? so, yes. Yeah. So, um, I nuanced myself out of it. Mm. Uh, I was finished up, one of the people I finished up talking to was Professor Stephen Davies, the, the political historian who is mm. also a statistician. So he's very good on this kind of thing. And he just made the observation, and it's an absolutely true one. And, and it, it's also one that makes life very difficult for any sort of liberal, including classical liberals like me who are conservative, mm. which is, Criminality is a power law, and it's a power law to use Professor Davies' expression with knobs on. That means a very small number of people commit crimes, and of those criminals, 10% of the criminals commit 90% of the crimes. And there's been lots of long-term studies done on this, including one in Dunedin in New Zealand, a longitudinal study that goes back decades that shows this phenomenon to be true. Mm. You know, nobody wants to get up in public and say, well, some people have criminal tendencies. Yeah. But the thing but is, all do. the evidence we have indicates that that is the case. Yeah. You know, so And so if you are a liberal, if you believe in the presumption of innocence, if you want to fight against over-criminalisation and the police turning up and deciding to get heavy-handed with peaceful protesters and so on, and so forth you have to also have an adult conversation about in the context of over policing how much of this was caused by the coronavirus legislation which was not scrutinized and has been a mess of drafting as numerous lawyers have pointed out i mean the lockdown skeptics tried to fight the covid legislation on the basis of science v science and it, it didn't work you don't have the resources you can't outgun the state if they'd have made it on the basis of civil liberties they might have actually done some good because what has happened as a result of that coronavirus legislation is differential policing. Mm. So basically Black Lives Matter, who were violent, were under-policed, and the anti-lockdown protest pressed protesters and the Sarah Everard vigil protesters were over-policed. Yes. And, and so I think, you, I think and, that, and I, I think that's and I think that's very obvious. Helen, I'm sorry we're out of time. We've got to go. Um, but thank you. Very interesting, fascinating. I'm sure we'll talk more about all of this uh, next week because there's a lot to get through because we wanted to even talk to you about the nuisance uh, business as well, which we haven't got to either. Um, 